begin this day in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we prepare to hear God's word this morning and prepare our hearts, let us take a moment to come before our God, to silence our hearts, and to hear God's word as he speaks to us. God's word tells us, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Would you please use this time as a time of silent reflection and prayer? If you'd like to, you can use the prayer of confession that is written uh, for you on the, uh, on the slide here, on the screen here, and just take a time to silently confess your sins before your Heavenly Father. God speaks to each one of us directly and clearly in his word, proclaiming to each of us that because of Jesus' death on the cross, our sins are totally forgiven. It is important for each of us to hear these words and to hold on to them by faith. And so I assure you this day, as a called and ordained servant of God's word, your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The first reading for this Sunday comes from Jonah chapter 3, beginning with the sixth verse. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let the people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent with compassion, turn from his fierce anger, so that we will not perish. When God saw all that they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life. For it is better for me to die than to live. This is the word of the Lord. The gospel lesson comes from St. Matthew, chapter 26, beginning with the 36th verse. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell down on his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is possible for this cup to be paid, taken away from me unless I drink it, and yet may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed a third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? 
Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. This is the Gospel of our Lord. So last week I began our series of messages by asking you a question, by asking you actually to fill in a blank, to, to complete this sentence, right? I asked you to think about this question. How do you answer this question? As I think about this last week, or as I think about this next week that's coming up, I feel blank. How would you fill in that blank? That was the first question. Second question was, why do I feel that way? And then the third question was, so what does this mean? The great Lutheran question, right? And the reason I asked those three questions, I used those three questions to set up this four-week series of messages entitled On This Rock, which is going to be a series of messages on the concept of emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence basically deals with three facets of our life. The first is our emotional part of our brain, the emotional center of our brain called the amygdala, uh, the place that generates all of the emotions that we ever experience in our life, right? that, that we all experience. right? The second facet of our life, the, of the message, is the, the thinking part of our brain, the cerebellum, right? The part that generates the thoughts and helps us to interpret what do we feel, right? Asks us the question, so how should I be thinking about what I'm feeling? And then the third concept that we're going to be talking about, the third facet of our life, is God's word. What does God tell us? What does Jesus tell us in, our, in his word about what we should be thinking about what we're feeling? What is the kind of external evidence that Jesus gives to us about what we should be thinking about what we're feeling? And so those are the three aspects that we're going to be talking about as we walk through this series of messages. Now, I'm guessing like most of you, over the last many weeks, I've been spending a lot of time on Zoom, right? Uh, every day, every week, I've got several meetings on Zoom that we've got with, um, you know, with our board of directors, with our staff, with our board for spiritual care, with uh, a team of people that's calling all of our members here at, at Redeemer to make sure that they're doing okay, um, with our, our CDC staff, with a finance team, small group, right, all kinds of different groups uh, that I'm having Zoom meetings with. And so it, it's really great to have those conversations. But I'm sure at some point in every one of those Zoom meetings, somebody's going to ask the question, or maybe I'll ask the question, how you doing? How you feeling? How are things going? And most people, when they hear that question, they'll say, well, I'm doing fine. I'm doing okay, right? That's the social convention. When somebody asks, how you doing? You say, I'm fine or I'm okay. Things are all right. But every now and then, somebody will take the mask off a little bit. They'll let the veneer down. And they'll say something like, you know, I'm really struggling. Um, I'm feeling lonely or uh, I'm feeling anxious. I'm nervous. Uh, I'm worried about this person or about this situation. Or maybe they'll say, I'm excited. Man, this has been going on. This has happened in my life and my family's life. And, and boy, I'm really excited about this, right? Well, the first step in emotional intelligence is being able to fill in this blank. I feel, right? That's the first step in emotional intelligence is being able to put our finger on and identify precisely and specifically what's going on in our amygdala, what's happening in our amygdala world, what kind of things our amygdala is, gen is generating, whether that be joy or sorrow or affection or excitement or fear or guilt or anger or being stressed out and overwhelmed or whatever those kinds of amygdala responses are that we're feeling in our life, the first step in emotional intelligence is being able to say, I feel this or I'm feeling this. Because I think that most of us, as we move throughout our day, we move throughout our day with the amygdala in the driver's seat of our life, right? We think things maybe, but more oftentimes we feel things, and so we say things and we do things based upon the amygdala, based upon what we're feeling in the moment, rather than actually engaging our brain and letting the cerebellum do the work and thinking through what we're feeling before we say something or before we do something. And I'll just be honest with you, there's lots of times in my life where I wish that I would not have allowed the amygdala response of my life to be in the driver's seat of what's going on, where I wish that I wouldn't have just said something or done something without first stopping and asking the question, how do I feel? What am I feeling? And how am I allowing those amygdala responses in my life to be in the driver's seat of my life? 
I wish there was times where I would have stopped and allowed the cerebellum to help me to think through what I'm feeling and maybe I would have said something differently or maybe I would have done something differently to have a different outcome or a different response. So how are you feeling today? I think it's interesting in the Bible, there's a couple of passages, there's a lot of stories actually in the Bible that help us to think through this kind of stuff. For instance, um, a passage from Luke chapter 10, a very famous story where Jesus is at the home of two of his, two his best friends, two sisters, Mary and Martha. And as Jesus is there, he's teaching the people that are there, and the one sister, Mary, is sitting at Jesus' feet, and she's just soaking up all the things that Jesus is saying. Meanwhile, Martha, Mary's sister, is kind of over there, and she's really concerned and uh, uh, taking care of all the details of the party, right? She's concerned with taking care of Jesus and all the guests that are at her house. The laundry list of things that need to be done is in Martha's head, and she's just singularly focused and concerned with making sure that all that stuff gets done. The Bible tells us that she's worried about these things, right? So much so that she sees Mary, her sister, sitting at Jesus' feet and not helping, and she's starting to have an amygdala response. She's starting to get anxious and worried. She's starting to get angry. And there starts to be this conflict between Mary and Martha because of Martha's amygdala response. So much so that Martha actually looks at Jesus and says, Jesus, would you tell Mary to get off of her seat? And give me a hand with the stuff around the house because she's not helping out at all. And Jesus actually calls her out and says, Martha, you are worried and anxious about many things. And the Greek word there is Mary Minao. And I'll come back to that in a second. But what's happening here is her amygdala response, the Mary Minao, the worries and anxieties of her life are now decaying the relationship between Martha and Mary and Jesus. And it's all driven by the amygdala. Another example is uh, Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the sower. Uh, Jesus tells this parable where a farmer is out throwing seeds out on his fields, and it's landing on all kinds of different soils, and the one kind of soil that the seed lands on is a soil that has all kinds of thorns and weeds on it. And the seed begins to grow, begins to uh, germinate and grow, but the, the weeds and the thorns quickly choke out that seed. And the point Jesus is making in the parable, he's using metaphorical language to talk about how sometimes the Bible, God's word, and particularly God's love and grace and forgiveness take root in our hearts and we start to experience the freedom that Jesus brings to each one of us. The new life that, bring Jesus, that Jesus brings to each one of us. And we start to just love it. But all of a sudden, the worries and the anxieties of the world around us start to create an amygdala response. The Mary Minao around us start to create that amygdala response, and they actually choke out that word of gospel, that word of freedom that Jesus brings to each one of us, and don't allow it to grow. Third example I'll tell you with you is um, actually from Luke chapter 12, where Jesus is teaching to his disciples, and he says, listen, do not, Mary Manao, do not worry about your life. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear. Don't worry about those kind of stuff. Because what's going to happen, you start to worry about it, and you have this amygdala response. And that Mary Manao, that worry is going to completely consume you. Because, you see, you have a Heavenly Father who loves you, and who knows what you need, and he promised that he will provide for you. And so in these texts, what Jesus is telling us is that this amygdala response, particularly this Mary Minao, this worry, this anxiety, this fear, all of those kinds of things that go along with that, all of this will, like a cancer, decay our relationships with each other and decay our relationship with God. And yet what Jesus tells us is that in the gospel, we hear a message, we hear about Jesus applying this powerful, restorative measure, this incredible blessing of his love and his mercy and his grace and his forgiveness and his truth. And he comes to us in the place of our amygdala response, where the amygdala is driving the bus, where those worries and those anxieties, those merry moments are just 
ripping apart our relationship with each other and with God, and Jesus applies that incredible message of the gospel, that powerful, restorative message. And he says, I got you. I forgive you, I love you, I'm with you, and I will never let the merry manaos of this world to take that relationship with us away. So don't you allow it to either. So how are you feeling? How do you answer the question, I feel blank? So this weekend, obviously, is Memorial Day weekend. And Memorial Day weekend is one of those weekends that's filled with a lot of amygdala kinds of things, right? It's filled with all kinds of emotions. Go to any cemetery where there's military uh, folks that have been interred there, and you'll experience all of those amygdala-type responses. Pride, sorrow, fear, all natural amygdala responses that we all feel in these kinds of weekends, right? Uh, but the question that I have as I think about that kind of thing is, does the amygdala response get the best of us? One of the things that I always say is, you know what, uh, weddings and funerals bring out the worst in people. And I say that somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but I also say that with 20 years of experience of seeing weddings and funerals getting the worst of people. And what I mean by that is that during weddings and funerals, there's all these complex emotions that people are feeling, right? Pride, grief, sorrow, anxiety, joy, uh, all of those kinds of emotions are all flooding together. And in those moments, in those events, the amygdala is driving the bus. And when the amygdala is driving the bus, sometimes people will say things and do things that if their cerebellum was engaged at all, they probably wouldn't say or do. But you know what? In these emotionally charged moments, guess what happens? The amygdala comes out. And sometimes it's Mary Minetto that's driving things, okay? So, and I, again, I often think, what would it be, what would be different about these kinds of moments if people would just say, okay, we're gonna stop because I'm feeling this way. And in that moment, engage the cerebellum and bring it in and say, you know what, folks, I'm just, I'm feeling this way. I wonder how that would change what people would say and do. This next few weeks and months, I know we're gonna be experiencing a lot of change. I know we're gonna be experiencing a lot of transition. The last couple of months, things have been rel relatively static. They've been relatively the same. Things haven't changed a whole lot, but now we are approaching a time where over the next few weeks and months, there's gonna be a lot of things that change, and it's gonna be a gradual change, but uh, probably a quite dramatic change as we get back to whatever it is that we're gonna get back to. And again, nobody even knows what that looks like, right? Are things gonna be what they were? Probably not, but we don't know what they're gonna be like. And the change is gonna be little after little. Things are gonna change this week and they're gonna change next week and they're gonna change the week after that and they're gonna to continue to change. And one of the things that I know is that when things change, people get anxious and they have amygdala responses. They get anxious, they get nervous because things aren't staying the same, things are changing. And I oftentimes wonder, as we move through this period of transition, will, we be, will our amygdala be driving the bus for the next two months? Or will there be times when we say to each other, you know what, I'm feeling this way. My amygdala is generating this. And so let's work through the amygdala response together so that what we say and what we do are a little bit different than what they would normally be if I were just left up to my amygdala responses. How are you feeling? There's this text in Matthew chapter 26 that we read just a couple minutes ago, the gospel, when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says these words, which I think are powerful words for Jesus to say. He says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. I'm feeling this to the point of death. I'm feeling this. And in this moment, what Jesus is doing and is what he's saying to Peter and James and John is, you know what? 
here's my amygdala response to what is happening in my life. Now here's what I'm going to do about it. But in that moment, in this moment, Jesus once again points us to his cross. And I'm really glad that we have this text because it's in this text that we see Jesus expressing his feelings, his emotions, his fears, his uncertainties, being overwhelmed and stressed to the end of himself. And yet what he does is he articulates that to us and to his disciples, and then he points them to the cross. Because a few minutes after this, he's arrested, and he goes to the cross, and he suffers, and he dies for us. Now, as I've mentioned throughout this message, there are lots of times in my life, and probably in all of our lives, when our amygdala has been driving the bus, and we say things, we do things that we wish we shouldn't have done, or if our cellar barrel was a little bit more kicked in, would have probably had us do something different or say something different. You see, that's called sin. When we say the things or do the things that we shouldn't do, or we don't say the things or do the things that we know we should do that are driving, driven by our amygdala. That's called sin. When we fall short of God's glory. And yet Jesus in this text reminds us that even though he's having an amygdala response and he vocalizes what he's feeling, that he's still going to a cross and there he's going to suffer and die for us to forgive us for all of our sins, to forgive us for all of the times when those amygdala responses break our relationships with each other and break our relationships with him. And he comes and once again, he applies that powerful healing message of the gospel, of his forgiveness and his love and his truth and his hope and his mercy. And he applies it to us right where we need to hear it. How are you feeling? The first step to this sense of emotional intelligence is being able to put our finger on it and say, this is how I'm feeling. This is what I'm dealing with right now. Now, in the next couple of weeks, as we walk through the series of messages together, we're going to get away from the amygdala response, start talking about the cerebellum, but also talk about how Jesus' word guides us and directs us, how this external source of data that God gives to us in his promises and his truth and his love helps us to walk through and to grow in this whole sense of emotional intelligence so that we can follow Jesus more closely, so that we can love him more intimately, so that we can love and serve each other more intentionally and directly. So I hope that as we walk through this time together, this first step, that you've been able to say, you know what, I feel this way. And maybe it's, I feel joyful, or I feel anxious, or I feel fearful, or I feel guilty, or I feel hurt, or I feel whatever. But more importantly, I hope that you can answer that question this way. I feel loved. I feel forgiven. I feel hopeful. I feel pardoned. I feel the presence of God. Because in these words, what Jesus tells us is, no matter if your amygdala is driving the bus of your life, God's word remains true to us. God's promises at the end of the day are the bus. His word, his love, his grace, his salvation are the bus. And he comes to each one of us here today, right now, and he reminds us of our true identity as baptized, redeemed, forgiven, adopted, Holy Spirit-filled children of God. And that each one of us has our entire lives built on this rock, the rock of Jesus. I God grant you this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now that we've heard God's word, uh, let us go to our Lord in prayer together. Heavenly Father, by your word and by the guidance of your Holy Spirit, you grow faith within each of us. Faith to know and trust your son Jesus as our risen Savior, proclaiming that he is alive and active among us today. Empower us to live by grace each day, growing in faith, hope, and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the King of heaven and earth. As we move through this health crisis, guide our national and global leaders. 
Give them your wisdom as they make decisions for the well-being of all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, you have called us to be people of faith. Help us this day to share our faith in our words, in our deeds, in our actions, so that others may come to know Jesus as the Lord and Savior. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, out of your hands of love, you have provided medical professionals, first responders, researchers, workers, military personnel, and many others who provide for our daily needs. Watch over them, protect them, and give them your strength to face their daily tasks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, many people throughout our world are in need. Shower your grace upon the sick and the suffering, the unemployed and the underemployed, the dying and the grieving, and especially those we name before you in our hearts this day. Lord, may they all know the strength and the comfort of your suffering, death, and resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, you have given your church faithful leaders to encourage us in our faith. We pray for the pastors, professional church workers, missionaries, and volunteers who serve around the world. Give them boldness to share your love faithfully that all people might come to faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. These and all our prayers we lift to you in the name of our risen and victorious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give to you his peace. Amen.
is well.